delightful to be with you again this uh, beautiful Wednesday evening. It's starting to feel like summer here in uh, on the island. And a welcome to Journeys, Stories of Faith from uh, Sacred Text to Living Testimony. And tonight it will be not only the last night that we'll be exploring the story of Jonathan, but uh, I won't be having any midweek meetings now through the rest of the summer uh, because I'll be traveling quite a bit. Uh, I'll be at camp next all next week doing blind camp, and then I'll be back for a week, and then gone for a week, and then back for a week, and and uh, so and then I'll be gone through all of August. So, but anyway, I, I just want to say how uh, happy I am that all of you have uh, taken the time to join us tonight. Uh, looking forward very much to our discussion and looking at the final final chapter of uh, the story of Jonathan. But before we go any further, let's bow our heads. We'll have a word of prayer. Our gracious Father, we want to thank you uh, for your kindness and your grace. We pray your watch care over us, your wisdom and insight. Uh, we pray, Father, that as we open your written word tonight, that your living word would be manifest in our midst and within our hearts to guide and direct us and give us encouragement and strength. In Jesus' precious name we pray. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> Forgive me, I got a little frog in my throat. <clears throat> so let's, uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, let's turn now uh, to 1 Samuel 19, verses 1 to 7. We're going to start there, and uh, we'll go from there into chapter 20 tonight, <coughs> and then... Uh, uh, and beyond. <clears throat> so, 1 Samuel 19, 1-7. I'm reading from the NIV. <clears throat> Forgive me again. I'm going to mute myself for a second. I have a, I have a bit of a cough here. Okay, let's just... Uh, I'll, I'll read uh, 1, 1 Samuel 19, 1-7. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan was very fond of David and warned him, my father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into a hiding and stay there. I will go out, stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He's not wronged you. And what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his own hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? <clears throat> Saul listened to Jonathan and took his this oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So Jonathan called David and told him the whole conversation. He brought him to Saul, and David was with Saul, as before. By the way, here's a little skill testing question. How many folks, how many times do you folks think, including this uh, uh, event, <clears throat> how many times so far in the story of, of, uh, of David uh, that Saul tried to kill him? One, once, twice, three times, four times? Uh, five times, what do you think? How many times so far has Saul tried to kill David? How many of you, uh, <clears throat> how many of you say, well, once, for sure once? More than that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, how many times, Sandy? How many three. times, Sandy? Two, you're, you're thinking two, Adam? I'm thinking three, maybe. Three? How about you, Sandy? I don't know, but it was quite a few times, maybe four. Okay. Yeah, you're you're actually right. And uh, when we when we go from uh, from here into into chapter twenty, uh, you see that it's it's five times. Um, and actually, here in in chapter nineteen, we see it, it, it. This this. By the way, maybe let me ask you this. Um, <clears throat> Saul, Saul in verse 6 says to Jonathan, took his oath, as surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. Uh, how long did that last, that oath? Not very long. I don't think he even meant it when he said it. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> 
yeah 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 the first the first time of course was when he threw his his uh javelin at david you remember that <clears throat> that was chapter 18 10 and 11 and then he tried to accomplish saul tried to accomplish his evil design by placing david at the front of the troops in the hope that he would be killed that's chapter 18 verse 17. Uh, next, Saul deceived him by promising him Merab, by giving her, remember that Saul had said, you know, hey, take my daughter. Um, and then David said, you know, who am I to be taking the king's, uh, you know, I, I have nothing, you know. <clears throat> and, uh, but he, you know, Saul had promised her to him. But then, if you'll re recall, he ends up giving, Saul ends up giving, uh, Merab to somebody else, and I think uh, I would I would say that he was probably testing David there too, trying to think, well, maybe what I can get him to do is to act rashly, and somebody else will knock him off, right? So that's three times, um, and after that, he gave David permission to earn a dowry for for I don't know how to pronounce it, Mike Michael, Michael, I don't know how it's pronounced exactly, by a dangerous mission. Do any of you remember what that one was? What was the dangerous mission? What did David have to do to earn the right of the hand of uh, Michal? Anybody remember? <clears throat> he had to go and knock off a uh, hundred Philistines, right? And bring back uh, their foreskins. <laughs> and he ended up bringing back 200, right? <clears throat> so once again, Saul is trying very desperately to get rid of this uh, this cursed man that he you know that he hates uh, with such with such passion and such such vengeance. <clears throat> um, so let me just uh, let me just go here. Let me just go. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so uh, and and verse eight it says that there was war again and david went out and fought with the philistines and struck them with a, with a mighty blow and they fled fled from him <clears throat> and then you guys all know what happens after this the whole story the whole chapter of, of uh, the rest of chapter 19 now becomes this this the, the falling away um of saul i mean saul just he ends up just you know he becomes just insane he just uh he goes crazy right um, in verse 15, then Saul sent messenger back to David, sent messengers back to see David, saying, uh, "Bring, bring him up to me uh, in in the bed that I may kill him." And uh, the messengers, uh, yeah, they're having troubles. And then Michal uh, saves David. She she uh, uh, intervenes in his behalf. Um, and then, if if you skip down, if you have your Bibles. Uh, we'll go down to verse 23 to 24, the last two verses of this chapter. Uh, so he went there to Namoth and Ramah. Then the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Neomoth of Ramah. And he also stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and laid down naked all that day and all night. Therefore, they say, is Saul among the prophets? So, so we, we're, what we're seeing here is, is really the demise of Saul. He's just going completely nuts. His desire for, I don't know if you can call it revenge or just plain murder. It's certainly not revenge. I don't know what you call it. Just his, his hatred of David is so deep that it's, it's driving him crazy is really what it is. <clears throat> um, but I want to go back to verse 5 of First Samuel uh, 19. Uh, I think Bonnie and, had her hand up. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Go ahead. Well, Steve, as you described Saul, he seemed, uh, you know, I, I see these narcissistic fellows today uh, who re revel in revenge. Yeah. But he he went he went crazy mental over jealousy. Yeah, that's the word. I, that's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, maybe he was a ladies' man, and David was good looking. And he seemed to you know, have the women um, said that he, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. And that'd be too much for two 
men who want to look good to women, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm so glad you brought, I never even thought of that, you know, yeah, it's because, hey, I'm sure that Saul was a ladies' man. I mean, he was head and shoulders over all the other men of Israel. He was a good looking man. That's how he's described in scripture, right? He was a man, and David, on the other hand, <clears throat> you know, um, he, there's no question he was a ladies' man, but, uh, you know, he's not described with the same kind of, uh, I think he was a good looking guy too, by the way. But um, I don't know that, you know, maybe so. So anyway, there, yeah, there's there's that that whole rivalry thing. That jealousy is is a hugely a part of the of this story. There's no question about it. And uh, so, yeah, it's the, it, and, and, and that jealousy, that rivalry is is driving uh, the king of Israel mad. And that's where we have uh, now in verse five, though, I want to focus now back on Jonathan. A little bit because what we're seeing here is Jonathan interceding all the way through the story the story of the life of Jonathan is uh, uh, in the valley between this his loyalty to his father to the king of Israel and his friendship and loyalty to David and uh, there's this war going on. He, you know, David, of course, is not is not at war with Saul. He's he's doing everything he can to live peacefully and, and honorably. Uh, but Saul is just losing his mind, desperate to try to kill David. He wants to get rid of him. And Jonathan is in the gap. Um, and so in these verses that we just read here, uh, you know, Jonathan says, look, my father's looking for a chance to kill you, be on guard. Uh, I'll speak to him about you and we'll tell you what I find out. Uh, then uh, uh, Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul and says, look, Saul, uh, look, father, father, you know, consider what's going on and, and the past history, the, the victories that have been won, and, you know. And uh, in, in verse 5, it's, this is a very interesting verse to me. He says, it, the, the scripture says this, He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. Now, of course, uh, Jonathan is talking to his father here, and he's making that statement. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. But I'm wondering if there's a subtle... Um, maybe a foreshadowing, uh, if there's a subtle uh, meaning to that statement that we, that is not apparent in the text, but that has to do with Jonathan. Do you have any idea what I'm, what I'm pointing at here, folks? Anybody? Just think about that. Just think about that. What 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 Jonathan says to Saul, he says David took his life in his own hands when he slew the Philistine. Well, what has Jonathan been doing all this time? He's been protecting David, right? So could it also be said that Jonathan is taking his life? in his own hands, standing between these two men. One king, one destined to be king. What do you guys think? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, Jonathan was a strategist. He was uh, one of those harmonizer type of people who who didn't offend anybody. He even talked his dad into things, you know, his furious, violent dad. And that's a, a, a incredible how, how his character was so um, harmonious, you know, he could, he could uh, deal with both sides. Yeah, you know, f folks, as Christians, how are we called to stand in the gap? Just think about it. How are we called to stand in the gap as Christians when we live our, our faith lives? Sticking together, being uh, being united. Yeah. Not uh, going um, against each other in front of people. You know, being that's the thing they look for is to see if there's any uh, people who don't get along in a church. 
uh, the, the one person I took to church, um, he was looking for clicks and that sort of thing. And I, I thought that was interesting. He really seemed to want to uh, know. Yeah, how do we treat each other, right? Yeah. Yeah, people's eyes are on that, you know. Um, <clears throat> standing in the gap. How, how do we as Christians stand in the gap? I, I remember uh, when I first became a Christian, just give you a little story. Um, uh, after about, oh, maybe six months or so, uh, it was back in 82, and there, the recession, there was a very bad recession, recession that hit in, in uh, Vancouver, in, in Canada, North America. Uh, the company I was working for, to make a long story short, I lost my job. So I ended up moving home with my folks. <clears throat> and of course I, you know, I told them that I'd become a Christian and that was, that was, uh, wow, that was very, very difficult for them, you know. Uh, I guess if I'd have been, you know, if I, if I hadn't have, you know, made a covenant uh, to stop drinking and smoking, um, I guess I, they really might not have even cared. But you know, how many years did my dad say, well, son, how many years has it been since we've had a beer, you know? <laughs> but anyway, let me get, get to my point. Um, one of the very first evenings that we were together, I came in through the door and I could smell that, that, that f food. It's like Esau, you know, and that savory stew, except for it was, it was my mom's. It was one of those meals that she knew was one of my very favorite meals. I'd grow, grown up on it. Uh, French Canadian split pea soup with a big ham hock in the middle of the uh, in, in the middle of the pot, and so I sat down at the table. And uh, well, what would you folks do? <laughs> I'm sitting there and thinking, oh boy, what am I going to do if I don't eat this this uh, uh, soup that Mum has made me? I am going to so deeply offend her. <clears throat> On the other hand, you know, I'd, I'd already taken a covenant to, to abstain from unclean foods. And so I'm sitting there at the table, and I have an acute sense of the fact that I am now standing in the gap, or sitting in the gap. Mm -hmm. and, I had, and the question I had to wrestle with was, was oh, good, we've got Ed joining us. <clears throat> the, the question that I had to wrestle with was, uh, how, on the one hand, do I honor God, and how, on the other hand, do I honor my mom? Uh, I could call it a moral dilemma, but I was definitely in the gap. And I remember sitting at the table there, and I'm praying quietly to God, what am I supposed to do? And I remember reading a, a verse from the New Testament where Jesus said, you know, it's not what enters into a man that defiles him, but it's what cometh out of the, uh, out of the, out of the, out of the heart, for, out of the heart, for it's in the heart where evil resides. And I went, thank you, Lord. And my mom served me that soup, and I ate it with great delight, even though it was awkward for me. I shut my mouth, and I ate the soup. Um, what do you folks think about that? Do you think that was compromise? That's just so highly intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so emotionally intelligent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, folks, we stand in the gap as believers. We, we live part of our our existence as as followers of christ is that we live as intercessors of 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 god's uh, grace to the world in which we live and sometimes that can bring great challenges for us and of course all the challenges i faced in my life are nothing compared to what jonathan faced absolutely nothing but we do stand in the gap and we use intercession often you know most often i think as, as adventists we use the the term intercession um uh you know in terms of prayer but it's in how we live our lives we 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 are constantly living it's it's like you know sometimes uh i i have found myself getting very grumpy in a grocery line or at a store somewhere or whatever i don't know if you guys have ever experienced this but you know you kind of lose your cool and then as you're leaving the store or whatever you think i wonder if anybody knew who i was in that crowd you know, um, did I did I shine a light on Jesus, or did I just cast, did I just uh, uh, send forth a dispersion of of darkness? What do you folks think? 
how we live our lives. Does, does this make sense to you folks? Um, yeah. Steve, I uh, have, a, have a little fellow friend, you know, the one that smokes and uh, they tried to give him a book once and uh, he gingerly took it, a book about prayer, but from Roger Morneau. The next time I tried to give him something, he put his hand up and he said, no, Bonnie, I'm watching you. Mm, I will wow. not learn from a book. I will learn from your life, he said. Wow, how did that make you feel, Bonnie? <laughs> I'm pretty much on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> it, it really did. But he's, oh, he's still, he's still uh, in my life. And uh, I want to have Bible studies with him. Um, he wanted to be a chaplain. That's, that was his goal in life. Uh, I don't know if he'll accept the Bible studies or not. Mm. Of course, you know, folks, uh, the real test for Jonathan, um, eventually it got to a point where Jonathan had to decide between his loyalty to his father and his loyalty to David. Uh, there comes a time when standing in the gap, uh, we all come to a place where we, we, we can no longer sort of just stand on neutral ground either. There comes a time when we have to stand up and, and be heard. We have to, you know, we have to take a stand, right? And the same thing happened for, for Jonathan. Eventually, he had to make a decision that he was going to side with David. He wasn't going to hide it anymore. He was simply going to stand in the gap and say, Father, I love you, uh, but I, I, you know, I'm simply going to have to make my commitment. And you know, Jonathan tried to keep that, to try to hide that as best he could, but eventually, um, uh, Saul talk, calls him the, a perverse son, right? He hates him so much, uh, he, you know. <laughs> so, um, um, anyway, Jonathan felt in his heart that David, uh, uh, you know, initially, you know, he wanted to, I, 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 in fact, there's that verse there. Where is that? First Samuel 20, verse 9, never, Jonathan said, if I had the least inkling that my father was determined to harm you, wouldn't I tell you? That's in chapter 20. I mean, Jonathan is all the way along. He's trying to thread the needle. He's trying to thread the needle. Um, but eventually, it just gets to a point where, uh, you know, we, we end up at the end of this chapter, a striking contrast between Saul's and Jonathan's ways of dealing with with these situations, Saul in his in his impatient, tyrannical, and you know he's bigot. He's a bigot, and he's hateful. He felt that he must be first, and uh, that what he said was correct and final. Anyone disagreeing him to him had to be eliminated, right? Regardless of of the means taken to do it. Yet his own son approached life from an entirely different angle, um, and so eventually the two of them parted ways. And yet, Jonathan still continued to remain loyal to his father. Um, but he made his decision. He was going to do everything he could to protect David. Um, so here's here's the question that I, I'd like to ask. Why the difference between the father and son? You know, you guys have all heard the expression, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Why the difference between Jonathan's approach and Saul's approach? When, when both had, you know, such, had much the same surroundings and training, did, did God illuminate Jonathan's life and not the other? Was Saul born to be evil and his son, by contrast, to possess noble traits of character? What do you guys think? He had a mother, too. Well, certainly. Maybe <laughs> yeah. he's more like her. Yeah. I don't think Saul liked her, but... <clears throat> didn't speak highly of his wife. Do you, do you folks ever wrestle with those questions? I mean, I don't know. How, let, let's, let me ask this question. How many of you, uh, is there anyone in this room here who's, who's um, all, all of your fellow siblings are members of the faith? How many of you here have, have fellow siblings who are all believers? Can anybody put up their hand? Oh, Adam can. Good. How about expand that out a little bit, uh, Bev? Okay. How about not only your siblings but your parents? How many of you can raise a hand and say all in the faith? Sandy, good. Okay. How many of you can expand that out a little bit now and to say not only your mom and dad and your siblings but their kids, all in the faith? 
Bev, you're doing, boy, you're doing good, Bev. <laughs> My brother's children are all in the faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's, it's lots of times in my life, and I wonder if you guys have, have struggled with this. You know, when I became a Christian, uh, one of the questions that often came to my mind is, well, why me? And why not my brothers and sisters? Why not my folks? Have you ever wrestled with that question? Why is it that, that you know, I, you know, I, me, your, your own soul, why have you embraced the gospel and others not? Similar surroundings, similar advantages. Why is that, that, that uh, uh, people make the decisions they do and, and others make the, the, the decisions that they do? You know, what, uh, uh, what do you folks think when you, when you wrestle with those questions? Anybody willing to share? Life is a series of choices. Uh -huh. And it, in the end, it, it comes down to the choice that you make. Yeah. Yeah, the choices we make are so important, and, and I've often wondered, you know, why is it that I made the decisions I have made? Mm -hmm. um, but you remember you remember the Apostle Paul, and I, I actually printed this one, so I have it here right in front of me. Um, but, you know, as I was thinking about this earlier, my mind went to Romans chapter 6, verse 16, um, and I clipped it here. I think uh, this must be from the New King James Version. To whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye right. are, right? Um, and so ultimately, you know, God gives us free choice. Um, you know, God gives us, uh, we, we give God our service, we give him our thoughts uh, and uh, our, our, our whole soul. And uh, ultimately, uh, we become his followers. Um, and <clears throat> ultimately, we have to choose between one of of two masters i had i had one of my old uh rugby buddies when in my 20s when i became a christian i was about 25 and you know he was sort of mocking me about you know because being a christian he said well you're weak you know you're just following and i said look i said we're all we're all uh we're all followers he said i'm not a follower i said yes you are there's not a single soul on, on this on the play on the face of the planet who does not follow somebody, <clears throat> somebody's philosophy, somebody's ideas, somebody's uh, whatever. I said we're all followers. Somewhere along the line, we've made decisions uh, based upon the ideas and thoughts, the influences of those who've gone before us. <clears throat> and you know, Jonathan, he he made those decisions. And I was uh, talking, doing a Bible study just recently, and um, I mentioned to the person I was studying with that the uh, philosophical background from which Adventism emerged uh, uh, is called Arminian. Are you folks familiar with that? <clears throat> um, Wesleyans, uh, the Methodist Church, we, we owe our sort of our philosophical heritage goes back to a guy by the name of Arminius and the Arminian approach to Christianity, uh, as opposed to Calvinism. Are you guys familiar with Calvinism? Yeah. Heard, heard of that? Calvinism puts its emphasis on predestination, right? If you're a Calvinist, you believe that God created some <coughs> to life and some to death. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas it, the Arminian approach is all about God's love and free will. And as Adventists, we have embraced a worldview, uh, the great controversy worldview that Ellen White champions is really at the heart of it, is the question of the God of love and the whole issue of do we, what, and personal soul responsibility. We make decisions because we have free choice. And so ultimately, every, everyone is to work out their own salvation with, with fear and trembling, right? <clears throat> and so Jonathan and Saul, and David, at the heart of this story is the question of faith. Ultimately, it's the question of faith. And how will you respond to faith? Uh, for Saul, let me ask you guys, do you see him, how do you see him responding to the issue of faith in his own life? Anybody want to just share any thoughts? How do you see Saul responding to the question of faith? Good or bad? 
he didn't have much. <laughs> <laughs> Short lived. <laughs> did did he have faith in himself or in God? Himself. himself. No. Yeah, that head and shoulder thing was was really problematic, I think, for Saul. The fact that he was heads and shoulders over everybody else. I I think it just gave him a little bit too much. Uh, I think uh, Bonnie, you said narcissist. Is that what, that was the term you used, right? Well, yeah. The, I heard one psych, psychologist say there is about seven percent of the population are narcissists, but I've also read that it's more like uh, closer to 20%. Yeah. It's very frightening. You see so many, uh, hear so many women telling about these guys they had to part ways with or got involved with and they were treated. To, uh, it, it's evil. It's yeah. evil. Yeah. yeah. Uh, David uh, and Faith. I mean, we could go on and on and on and on and on and on and on, couldn't we? And usually, you know, what I've found over the years is that, uh, you know, when we look at this, when we look at for Samuel, we go into Second Samuel, we we were focusing on David, uh, and that's why I wanted so much to study a little bit on the story of Jonathan because he's in the gap. His story is one of incredible faith. Uh, he is one who has to thread that needle in his life and ultimately into his death. Um, and, you know, you might ask the question, you know, wh why is it? Uh, is it even fair that, that Jonathan ultimately, you, know, you all know what eventually happens. Uh, when we go into 1 Samuel 31, uh, and I don't know if you have your Bibles, you want to want to quickly go there, but uh, the, the story of, of, uh, of David and, and Saul and Jonathan, uh, at the end of, at the end of, the ch of chapter 20, um, you know that we see this this parting of ways. Uh, in fact, maybe let, let's just read the end. I, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, let's let's go back. First Samuel 20, 41 to forty two. Uh, look look how it's how that chapter ends. As soon as the lad had gone, you remember the story about the arrow shooting the arrows and right. They're going to have this final meeting and and David. You know, saw, uh, uh, Jonathan's going to ascertain whether or not it's safe for David. And of course, the, the answer is he's, it's not safe. And so they have this final parting. And by the way, this is essentially the last time, not the, I mean, it's not, it's essentially the last time that we, 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 we see this Jonathan in scripture here. Um, so it says as in verse 41, it says, As soon as the lad had gone, David arose from the place towards the south fell on his face to the ground and bowed down three times. And Jonathan and David kissed one another, and they wept together, but David more so. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, since we have both sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, May the Lord be between you and me, and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Um, I found that so interesting reading that today um, as I was looking at that. Go in peace since we have both sworn in the name of the Lord saying, may the Lord be between you and me. It's almost as if, it's almost as if the writer of, of First Samuel is, is making a point here. You know, Jonathan all the way along has been and continues to be in the gap between David and Saul. But this final, final closing scene of Jonathan's uh, in relationship with David, and it, and it goes on for here, by the way, it's, it's not until chapter 31 that he, he finally, you know, how that story comes to end. But this verse is so profound. Then Jonathan, go in peace. Since we've both sworn in the name of the Lord, may the Lord be between you and me. It's, it's almost this, this transition. Jonathan was in between David and Saul now. We're, we're this this chapter, this scene is closing. May the Lord be between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So he rose and departed and Jonathan went into the city. Pretty interesting, isn't it, folks? And then, uh, if you have your Bibles, let's go to chapter 31. And uh, 
let's let's close out the story of Jonathan here. Chapter 31, verses 1 to 2. Now the Phil Philistines fought against Israel. The Israelites fled before them, and many fell slain on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines pressed hard against Saul and his sons, and they killed his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malki Shua. <clears throat> and that's the end of Jonathan's life. So faithful to David, so uh, uh, consistent in his attempt to try to be a mediator between David and Saul, and he eventually dies at the side of his father. What do you think? You think David Jonathan will be in the kingdom? Without a doubt. Do you think Jonathan made the wise choice? Do you think Jonathan should have just said, Dad, I'm done with you. I'm hiking it out, and uh, I'm going to go join the camp of David? That's a hard one. The Bible says, honor your father and mother. Yeah. It doesn't say, honor your good mother or your bad father, or you know. I'm so glad I didn't have to live Jonathan's life. <laughs> <laughs> he had skills though he was up to it he had real skill we find that in in re regular life the things that we um are really good at the lord puts us into very difficult situations that use those skills i found that in my own life you know i think the question uh naturally arises why did the lord permit jonathan to be slain along with his father when his ad when his when his attitudes were totally contrary to those of saul you know um he loved his father well, why didn't god allow him to live there has to be an end to the movie <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was because Jonathan really had more rights to the throne than David. And if he had lived, would that have not caused conflict? Yeah, thank you for inserting a little sanity into the midst of my, <laughs> my thinking, Bev. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what I've always admired about Jonathan. It was that, you know, he really had had rights to the throne, but he gave those rights up. Um, you know, he ceded them to David, which he didn't have to do, but he did. That, that made him a great man, I, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, you see in Jonathan's life here, uh, you know, we think about type and anti-type. Do, do, do you see Christ in his life? Yes. You know, he laid down what was due him uh, to allow for a lesser man to take his place, his, his quote-unquote rightful place, according to the laws of men. Right? I mean, he's a, he's a fascinating character, absolutely fascinating character, very inspiring. Um, yeah, and, and ultimately, you know, <laughs> I, uh, you know, Bonnie, I really appreciate your sort of tongue-in-cheek answer um, because ultimately, you know, we live in a broken world and, um, there are sometimes reasons to things that we don't, we don't see. Uh, this is not a fair world. Um, and so ultimately, um, you know, once, uh, the relationship of, of our own soul to God has been um decided upon um then you know living continuing to live or not in this world uh is not of prime prime importance right um you know philippians 1 20, 20 23 you know we we may magnify christ by by life or by death <clears throat> and um Anyway, so so I think Jonathan, yeah, ultimately we we see a type of Christ here. He laid down his life uh, that others may prosper. 
that others may you think of think of John the Baptist, right? I see I see when I think of Jonathan, I think of John the Baptist. How difficult it must have been to step aside and let others let another um take his place. Why, you know. And I, I appreciate Bonnie bringing that word narcissist up because um you know, Saul and Jonathan is the same gene pool. But for some unknown reason, things that we will only maybe begin to understand through the fading of of the, the eter, eons, you know, in in redemptive in our in, in in heaven, you know, we'll begin to understand why it is that people end up where they end up, why they make the decisions they make. I mean, these really these kinds of questions are mysterious. Uh, but Jonathan, yeah, he's a type of Christ. Certainly, I see John the Baptist there, um, laying his side, you know, laying down his his uh, his rights that other that another may may take his place. It's a beautiful story, and it doesn't end there. There is one, uh, you know, there is an epilogue. Uh, thank you, Bonnie, for the story must end. All good stories must end, but this story is not over yet. What yet? comes what fantastic thing do we find yet in uh second uh, samuel chapter 9 if you have your bibles let's turn there you remember that david and jonathan made a made a covenant with each other that their descendants uh would would that each each one another would take care of each other you know in in, in you know that that there were that the good would not befall our families and that uh so on and so forth uh, anybody have a Bible? Maybe read uh, 2 Samuel chapter nine verses one to four, and, and that's sort of where we're gonna where we're gonna end this this study on. Now life. David said, "Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake?" And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him. Are you Ziba? He said, at your service. Then the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is a lame, who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, where is he? And yeah. Ziba said to the king, indeed, he is in the house of uh, Maker, the son of, uh, sorry. That's why, that's why I thought we would stop right at the beginning. Of, oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. There. So, guys, what was the name of this son? Any of you remember? Amiel. No. Was he the... Mephibosheth. Ah, Mephibosheth. Meth I always have such a hard time pronouncing that. Mephibosheth. <laughs> <laughs> and and you all know the story, right? Uh, his, you know, they were fleeing. His, his, the, the, his servant, the maid servant, dropped him, and uh, ever since, you know, he was lame. Uh, and you you all remember what happens? David sends sends his uh, courier, courier courtiers or whether they they go get him, they bring him back and. And uh, for the rest of his life, Mephibosheth and his uh, his family, they they dine and live well at the king's table, in honor of Jonathan. It's uh, yeah, it's the uh, it's the the real the, the tragic, but yet wonderful conclusion of the story. And uh, guys, it's a it's a magnificent story. You know, it's to me, I, I think it's a blockbuster. Uh, I remember back in the eighties or nineties, nineties or somewhere back then, Hollywood decided to make a film a film on the life of uh, of um, David, and uh, I, Richard Gere I think starred in it. I don't know if that means anything to any of you, but anyway, I remember the movie vaguely. Um, and uh, yeah, great, great story, great hero, but. In the gap, there was there was one whose life was equally magnificent, and it's the story of Jonathan, and it ends with this uh, sad but triumphant uh, story of great that that illustrates God's grace. Uh, so faith, in the end, uh, bears fruit unto the kingdom, and uh, I think that's where we'll end. Dear Father, thank you. A small group tonight. Summer's coming. Uh, our numbers are are dwindling. 
Uh, but we're so thankful for the story. It's so inspiring, so encouraging, and I, I just feel so lucky, Lord, to be able to have been uh, focusing uh, for the last couple of days, whenever I had a few minutes on this story, and to be able to talk about it tonight and think about it. It, re re it reminds us that you are a God of grace and that we are, we are embraced in love. Help us, Lord, to make those decisions that in our lives, big and small, that honor you. Watch over our church members, friends and, uh, of the Rest Haven Church throughout the, the next couple of months and uh, grant us your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.